And um, when I looked at our theme uh, for this seminar, uh, namely uh, gender justice between theory and practice, for the first time I decided to look at every single uh, little bit of um, the components that for me makes up um, the theory relating to this. So for the first time, that's why it's actually took me a little bit longer than anticipated. I looked at every single aspect, which I think is a part of what um, leads to gender injustice. And so I try to really make like a comprehensive overview. And in that uh, regard, uh, there are little bits and pieces of last year's lecture, but it's almost nothing. So um, what I'm going to try and do today is to let me just move this little picture of all of your faces. There we go. I, within the broader theme of gender justice between theory and practice, I want to look at, I think the sub theme or the connecting theme of my lecture is crossing boundaries and um, doing justice as non-binary practice. I think that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus a lot on doing things non-binary. Now, why I look, think about um, that this is the main theme of my lecture, that is why I added this quote by Harriet Tubman, because um, in, when it comes to gender justice, uh, there are some things that in the world and in communities and religious communities have shifted um, over thousands of years. But it's one of the slowest shifts with regard to um, injustices in the world. And a lot of it's got to do with that we are entrenched in a certain type of box in our binary thinking. And that's why I thought the quote by Harriet Tubman is very appropriate. Um, I used it at the Q College this year as well. In my mind, I see a line and over that line, I see green fields and lovely flowers and beautiful white women with their arms stretched out to me over that line. But I can't seem to get there, no how. I can't seem to get over that line. Something about that there may be a lot of opportunities available or it, on, the, on the surface, it seems as if there is a lot of opportunities uh, available. It might seem on the surface that things have been sorted out, um, but you can't get over the line if you can't even get to the line, but probably speaking. And I think that's basically what today's lecture is gonna be, uh, be about. So um, here is a brief outline of it. So we're starting with components of what I call gender injustice. And like I said, I tried to do this comprehensively for the first time in at least the way that I've taught this. I'm starting to, I'm starting with um, a, a consideration of binary thinking and binary gender in culture and religion. And then I look at different notions, trying to once again set up the puzzle pieces of what makes up the foundation, the theoretical foundation um, the epistemological foundation of gender injustice, trying to get to a practice of gender justice. So I look at power and sexism and language. Then recognizing the co components of gender justice, I start looking at recognizing intersectionality. I look at the concept of justice and how feminist uh, scholars specifically have looked at the variety of different justices. And once again, as I did last year, I briefly considered the issue of equality and equity. And then in between the lecture, there is these what I call awareness exercises throughout. It's questions um, designed to help us um, sort of also um, implement what we did in that section before um, that uh, awareness exercise. But mostly it's about creating awareness of the specific topic that I then mentioned. So these awareness exercises will typically take place at the end of a certain theme. And then I end up off today's uh, lecture with about what can be done with it. Now, this lecture is uh, consisting over a bunch of slides uh, and uh, this will go on during this morning session and the section just after our small break. So um, I'm aiming to get through about half of it and do the other half afterwards. So it's not gonna be only like a lecture before and then only discussion afterwards. I want us to break up the different pieces of um, the lecture so that we don't get tired and we are engaged all the time. So welcome and um, let's start. If I can just move my, comp there we go, okay. So I'll start off with something that some would say is obvious. However, it's not that, it's, it's 
it's insidious, basically. Insidious, I'm going to get to what that means later on. In other words, it's quite deeply ingrained in our thought processes. Now, usually, the first thing for me when it comes to recognizing the components of gender injustice is a binary gender framework. Okay. Oh, sorry. Let me go. There we go. Now, usually sex and gender are used interchangeably alarmingly often, even though um, a lot of awareness in this field, uh, in this specific area has been created, sex and gender, the terms, are used interchangeably a lot still in a lot of debates, a lot of areas, a lot of fields, and especially amongst people walking around in the streets, in communities, going about with their everyday lives, use these words interchangeably a lot. And this has got results. Sex, as you know, refers to a biological classification. Um, hormones, organs, and chromosomes, which are then designated male and female. That's usually when a baby is born, someone would say it's a girl or a boy. They are making that classification based on um, biological aspects. Um, although uh, you will see there in the middle of the screen, Anne Faust Sterling in 2000 did a study, and she's actually indicated that even biological sex is assigned a little bit too easily because we think that we can separate this from our social type of um, thought in this regard. And um, we can't really. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to get rid of something at the top of my screen, but it's not working. So I'll just leave it for now. Um, so even assigning biological uh, classifications is not uh, exempt from all our conditioning and our social structures. But as I go on, I will keep on delving deeper into this. So the word gender refers to a complex set of social norms and expectations about the proper behavior of human individuals according to biological sex they are assigned. And it's very important that we read that last little bit. The biological sex they are assigned. So when a child is born and someone makes a pronouncement, it's a boy or a girl, um, they are assigned a biological sex. And according to that biological sex that they are assigned, a whole lot of gender social constructions comes crashing down onto that child. The child doesn't know it at that stage, but everyone around them has been part of this construction of what gender refers to, what it is for their whole lives. They've been getting it in through the air, through um, sitting around tables, talking in discussions, every sphere of their work. It's so part of everything that people do and think that they don't realize that it's happening. So, um, people assigned to a male or a female sex are expected to behave in accordance with respective gender norms in their societies. Now, my societies work in terms of a binary gender um, norm, which means um, humanity is divided into binary categories, which is masculine and feminine. They are used the masculine and the feminine because that is gender categories. And uh, if you are a male, you are expected to act according to a list of aspects. If you are a woman, feminine, what defines femininity, there's also a bunch of, of a list of aspects. So you are born, you are assigned um, a biological sex. According to that, you get gender. Then the gender norms get come crashing down on you. I just want you to keep this picture um, in your minds as we continue. Now, these norms shape almost all aspects of your life and it helps or hinders one's work opportunities and conditions your responsibilities and access to resources. Just a little sideline um, remark. When I was um, going to the restroom before I started this lecture, and this was like um, 15 minutes ago, two colleagues of mine were standing in the foyer of our building and um, as this happens when a public conversation is held in an open space, when one's ear does catch some words and phrases. And because I am busy with this this morning, I specifically heard that. And it was very interesting because um, it's actually a little bit ironic, but it also goes to prove uh, how part this is of our everyday life. So two of the colleagues in the faculty are talking about what type of things men and women usually do. And the one um, is a man uh, talking about how he cooks and the other one is a woman talking about how she doesn't cook. 
And I burst out laughing because I said to them they should come speak at the gender justice lecture this morning and provide examples in this regard. So, um, yes, it's everywhere. It shapes every aspect of our lives and the construction and conditioning starts at a very, very young age. Um, a study and some of my students that are sitting in might know this, sorry for the repetition. There was a study conducted in around about, uh, I think five or so years ago. And it was conducted by a psychologist working for the BBC. And it was conducted uh, with regard to a small group of children. They were aged seven and they were born in the UK, in the United Kingdom, um, in the year that Britain uh, put into um, work, you know, um, it started operating the broadest legislation, government rules and laws they had so far that is focused on gender equality. So they were born in a time where the whole gender pay gap and those type of things should not have existed for them. What the psychologist finds out when he visits the school and he conducts, his, uh, uh, sits in in their classes for um, for 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 a few months, he starts to realize that these children who have, should not have been exposed to this in society because they were born in a society where this is not an issue. At the, year, at the age of six and seven, all their gender constructs are formed, clearly, completely. So you would get, for example, a girl who would think that she won't be good in sports, and the moment she throws the javelin or the shot put ball further than some of the boys, um, she starts crying because she thought she wouldn't be able to do it. The boy that throws the shot put ball um, in a, on a shorter distance than the girl in that experiment, uh, he also starts crying and then he gets angry. He starts to hit um, the playground, some of the implements on the clay playground, because why did a girl throw the ball further than him? So on seven years of age, these gender constructs have been firmly established. And that's very scary because those children did not get to that point by themselves. Someone imprinted this upon them this binary gender framework. That's just by way of introduction. So let's continue. So if I talk about a binary framework, what do um, I talk about? What is this about? So I connect this to gender injustice. And this is a picture that I always use with my students. I'm gonna go into detail with that now as well. A binary framework refers to either or categories or absolute opposites. In other words, you've got a spectrum of whatever is happening, anything. Um, say, for example, let's use an example that I'm going to use later on. Let's use the boundary opposites of day and night. Now, day is the one opposite, night is the other one, okay? But in between, you get sunset and sunrise, and you get early morning, you get um, a late morning, you get early afternoon, you get late afternoon, you get early night, you get late night, you get night. There's a whole spectrum on those absolute opposites in terms of day and night. So our reality is actually not made up of binary oppositions. Everything that we witness in life, everything we experience is on a scale, it's on a spectrum. But yet, because of a type of philosophy, because of a type of framework that has been carried over, we only focus on the binary opposites. This is dangerous because if we do that, we presume that everything we are and know and experience will fit into neatly into one of those boxes, into one of those opposites. And it's a relationship between opposing ideas and the one side of the binary pair is usually seen by a particular society or culture as more valued over the other. I use the word night and day because we don't attach value to that. So it's a little bit of an easy example. But what if we start talking about masculinity and femininity and we talk, start talking about gender. If I say gender, gender is a construction, I really want to emphasize this and you're going to discuss this later in your groups as well. The idea that men should conduct themselves in a certain way and women should conduct themselves in a certain way. Men are allowed to do certain things, women are allowed to do certain things. Men are able and capable to do certain things and women are able and capable to do certain things. Can you hear that's a construction? That is something that is human made. At birth, a child cannot at that stage illustrate what they're able to do. So it must come from another place. And that is why gender is a construction. But what do we do? We get stuck in the binary framework, for example. And what, we, what happens when we get stuck in this binary framework is 
that we see male and female as those ends and we assign value to them. And we don't realize that there's the reality actually in life points to this whole spectrum. That would mean that is why people are gender queer. That is why people would be transgender. It's not because it's a new thing and suddenly it's happening all the more. It's because we are realizing all the more that everything in life is on a spectrum. But we are only always thinking about the binary and we get stuck in the binary. And therefore, something like human sexuality is, of course, very diverse. And I'm not going to get into that this morning because that's a whole different discussion. Although, as you will see later on in the Christian church and the Christian religion, um, gender um, and sexuality is linked to one another for a specific reason. Therefore, gender identity and gender expression, how you think about yourself and how you demonstrate your gender is on a spectrum. It's not in complete opposites. And that's interesting because we get stuck in these binaries and we think binaries is the only way to think about ourselves in reality, where reality is actually the opposite of that. Reality is on a spectrum. And this reality is on a spectrum with everything, humanity, nature, creation, everything going on around us. So if we start to look at what happens in a binary framework um, when it comes to gender and Christian religion, we see that Christian religious binaries which function as the justification of constructed gender roles and gender norms usually make use of the Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28 text. Now a small disclaimer here, um, I am a part of the Christian religion and I'm ordained Christian uh, minister in, in one of the reformed churches and therefore when I speak about binary framework and gender I will do it from this religion's perspective. That is not to say I'm excluding anyone, it's just that I simply know the best about how the religion that I'm part of functions and I know from studying um, different religions that there are similarities but I will not presume to make those um, correlations when I'm going to speak this morning about religion and the, the whole thing about theory and practice um, in terms of gender justice in religious communities, I will speak about the Christian religion, but I will always say it on the screen as well. So <clears throat> when we start to think at these binaries in the Christian religion, they are, when it comes to male and female, everything gets pulled back to the Genesis 1, 26, 28 text. That is the text that says God created male and female, man and woman. And in so many debates, in so many discussions, this text is used as the foundation. What actually happens is it's being used as the perpetuation of a binary. So it says, yes, but in Genesis we read, and then the Bible says God created male and female, so there's nothing else. And uh, therefore, um, or everything that we construct around gender is biblically founded because, yes, it said God created male and female. That's a problem. It's an interpretation that has been persistently perpetuated. There are two types of human beings, man and woman, and woman, therefore, is the inferior version of a man. That's how that text is interpreted. This, what I call two types, as the mold for the whole of humanity. So this imputation is used. This is the blueprint for the whole of humanity, is the foundation of a binary gender construction, at least in the Christian religion. Interpreting the text in that way is the biggest, largest foundation of a binary gender construction. So the, a binary gender construction is the direct result of interpreting that text as a mold or a blueprint for the whole of humanity. Now, constructed gender is the root of Christian religious communities' problem with the diversity of sexuality. Gender roles are included in how religious texts are interpreted. That's the one problem. And utilized to formulate ethical perspectives. That's the other problem. Gender roles are included in how religious texts are interpreted. Why would you want to include gender roles in how you interpret gender in religious texts? Why would you want to do that? But we do that, and it leads to a whole host of problems. A consequence of the binary is that value is assigned to gender. So first of all, we split up humanity into two absolute categories. So there's nothing in between. Okay, that's the first thing. We say that those categories are the only formation of humanity, and that would be one thing. But what we then do is we apply a whole list of things attributed to those two categories. And if you don't fit into one of them, we push you out, we hurt you, we violate you, and you say you are not a human being. That's the problem. That is the problem. And within a binary gender construction, when it's connected to religion and culture, the history says to us that the binary value 
um, uh, assigning means that women has got less value than men in terms of this gender construction. So there is, however, a problem with this interpretation, and I thought I will set the scene for that this morning. Genesis 1 verse 26 and 28, so I'm putting up a different interpretation on the table, is not a mold for cementing gender norms. Um, a figure of speech that was used quite a lot in ancient times named the whole of reality by naming only the opposite poles. For example, that's why I use that day and night. When we say in reading Genesis that the, um, um, the people who confessed about God's creation wrote, God created day and night, didn't mean only day and night. It meant sunrise, sunset, early, late morning, and early and late uh, afternoon, and early and late night. Day and night included the whole spectrum of all the different times. In the same way, man and woman function as a description of the variety of the humanity in the language of the time. What am I trying to say? When the people confessed that God was, God was the initiator of creation, God decided to get into a relationship with humanity. I'm not a biblical scholar, but I teach this when I do theological anthropology. What's important is to realize that with the language of their time, they tried to describe the variety of everything, and those were the terms they used in terms of this um, a figure of speech. And a proof of this is that later on in the New Testament, we get the very famous text, which is nowadays, most of the time, hopefully, recognized as um, the uh, sort of parallel to the Genesis text when it comes to gender and male and female. The Galatians 3 verse 28 text, which is one of the texts that is much older and closer to the time of Jesus, because uh, the writings of Paul actually took place a lot of them before um, the writing of the Gospels. And we get the text there in Paul's writing to the uh, congregation. There is no male or female, no slave, no free man, no Jew or Greek. That's the whole verse. All are one in Christ. And the text is in that regard a, um, a broadening of the confession in, in Genesis. But see what happens immediately. After a few years have gone by, the way that we describe humanity has already been broadened to not only male or female, there are other categories as well. And in fr from a theological anthropology perspective, Christ is the embodiment of God's image. Christ is. Christ is God become human. So if we want to look at how embodiment in God would look, it would be Christ. And what do we read in Galatians? In Christ, there is a new identity that supersedes gender norms. So where the first text is about variety, the second one is about unity and equality. And neither variety or unity and equality says anything about a binary gender constructions. So, um, and this is known, this, this, this is known about these texts and yet they are still uh, utilized in the way that they are. When it comes to gender and culture, the binary framework, Gender roles are important aspects of certain cultural prescriptions with regard to the role of women in the household and society. And culture many times determines the way a woman has self-determination in matters concerning her body and her relationship choices, whether she has the autonomy to decide on her way of life and career, etc. And the influence of culture extends beyond the masculine, feminine, gender binary. I put that in because uh, although a lot of what we will discuss today is deconstructing this masculine, feminine, gender binary. Remember, the moment uh, you start with binary thinking, everything else that does not fit into those two categories is also ostracized. And therefore, um, the influence of culture does not only extend towards um, gender constructions about how a woman would have to know her place and a man is the head of the house, for example, it would also extend to anyone that is according to that culture's gender construction, not properly male or properly female. And these people would also be on the receiving end of um, the bad, uh, harmful effects of a binary framework. So in his article, his chapter in the book, Living with Dignity, Gender Equality in Africa, um, he writes about masks and the men behind them unmasking culturally sanctioned gender equality. And he states the following things about culture. Cultural practices can have different purposes. Cultural practices are vehicles of Eastern identity. 
there are symbols, but these symbols are temporary. And that's a thing we sometimes miss with different culture because symbols can change or be reinvented or put aside, said Zulu. Think about cultural practices, which you maybe grew up with. Some of them are existing today. Some of them might not be valid anymore. Some of them might be changed or filled with new content. Some cultural practices can enslave, and this leads to a loss of human dignity. And this needs to be transformed, he says. And because these cultures are patriarchal, we're going to talk about patriarchy in a moment, to deconstruct harmful cultural practices means men must be convinced of some of the harmful practices. So binary framework in terms of gender is one of the main components when it comes to gender injustice. And this links up with the nexus, what I always say that takes place, the relationship between religion and culture, and how these two sometimes mutually reinforce one another. What are the effects of a binary framework? Let's briefly look at them. The three H's is one of the main effects of a binary framework. And from the three H's, sorry, I've just asked for some coffee. Otherwise, I'm not going to get through today. <laughs> um, the three H's, which is the primary effect of a binary framework, um, leads to other effects. But the three H's are hierarchy. So a binary framework relates number, number one, first in a hierarchy of gender, in that order, masculine, feminine, everything else. Okay. The second H that results from a binary framework is heteronormativity. In other words, heteronorm, norm, hetero, so the norm for what it means to be human becomes the default male, hetero, and the default straight male. And then when it comes to intersectionality, you can add other um, categories to that as well. We've got an exercise later today about intersectionality. And the third H, which is the third result of a binary framework, is hegemony, a social, cultural, ideological, and economic dominance. So the effect of a binary framework are those threes, hierarchy, heteronormativity, hegemony. So it means the moment you start to divide human beings in binary opposites and you assign and construct roles for them, putting them and recognizing diversity is nothing. That's fine. We are not the same. We will never be the same. But putting them in a binary opposition and assigning gender roles to them, that's, that's a huge problem. And then you get the result of that, which is the hierarchy, the heteronormativity, the hegemony, hegemony, the three H's. The main effect of all of those is violence, violence in all its forms, um, economic violence, physical violence, emotional violence, um, a lot of different types. What are the other effects? Christian religious communities are still debating gender equality of women with men, and it's not even gotten to the point where they can realize and recognize gender as a social construct. In so many of my discussions and so many debates, so many readings, um, I see that um, realizing that gender is a construct, something that has been made, that people were not born to do certain things. These things that they are supposed to do is enforced upon them when they are born. It's the other way around. Many communities are not by at that point. And the reason they are not at that point is because they get stuck in a binary framework. And they're not able to realize that it's a binary gender framework. Um, so that's why a lot of Christian religious communities are still debating gender equality of women with men. And uh, that results from that, of course, is the whole debate concerning um, human sexuality. Um, globally, women are mostly on the bad receiving end of the three H's, heteronormativity, hierarchy, and hegemony. And is it, it severely impacts their status as moral agents. In other words, to be able to make choices about their own um, uh, moral agency in life, to be able to make free choices, to be able to go, to be able to be in a um, partnership with someone, um, to be able to wake up in the morning and make either choice, choice A or choice B. Um, um, it impacts their livelihoods and it impacts their health as well. However, transgender people are also victims of the three H's because an overarching social system perpetuates the three H's. And the overarching social system that perpetuates the three H's is called patriarchy. And patriarchy is not about individual men. It's about a social system that everyone participates in. So it's much, much, much broader than only a few men participating in it. 
So here we get to our first awareness exercise. Okay. So what's going to happen? I'm going to read through the questions with you. I'm very happy that we are there already. And I'm going to ask Nora when I finished uh, reading the questions to divide you into groups. You are going to discuss this. I think it's in on my watch. Let me see. It's let's say I'll be finished reading about at 940. I want to give you about um, 10 minutes, hopefully, if that's if that's too short. Nora, is that too short or will that be OK? I think it will be OK. okay. If they need more. <clears throat> I mean, I can close the sessions whenever you want. We can okay. go for 10 and see. Yes. Let's go for 10 because I want to get a little bit of feedback as well and then continue with the lecture. So taking, keeping in mind everything that I said up to now in terms of a binary framework for gender, which uh, is one of the components of gender injustice, okay? Consider your immediate surroundings in everyday life, school, work, church, home, shops, you visit, everything, and then consider your reactions to these questions. Section one, have you experienced or witnessed any binary gender roles? And you are going to be in a group. So I suggest you um, read through all the questions the mere moment you get set up into your group instead of, uh, you know, um, getting fixed or stuck in one question and provide then an overarching type of response to this. But of course, your response will be made up of the different questions. Section two, who has got authority in your community and context? When you express leadership skills, how do others react to you? Are there times you would like to be a leader, but then you don't put in the effort? What holds you back? Section three, what does your society value the most? In other words, when does person have value? Section four, who is the main subject? Think about the last movie you watched or book you read or anything that's got to do with media. Compare the male and the female characters and what they were doing in the movie or the other media you want to reference. Did you notice any differences in terms of how the male and the female characters, um, what they were doing? And when you ask a male friend or partner to watch a movie where a lead actors are women, what is their reaction? So in other words, I want everyone in the group to consider this question. In other words, Im imagine what if you would ask someone from an opposite um, sex to watch a movie where the lead characters are not what you are used to, for example, what is your reaction? Are you also welcome to deconstruct the questions if you want? And then number five, section five, who is expected to be in control? Can you think of a situation in which a man was not leading the situation or in control? How was he regarded? Was he called names? Can you think of a situation in which a woman was leading or in control of men? How was she regarded? Was she called names? Now, this is just a little bit of an awareness exercise in terms of thinking about your own experience. And remember, many of the times we experience a lot of these things, but we don't realize that we do. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the remarks you made now will lead perfectly and add up to the section we're going to talk about sexism, because exactly what Catherine has said and what Marie Louise has now mentioned is about the different types of that. And there are overt ones and more some ones that are invisible. And we're going to get to that. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, just a note on these awareness exercises. I actually designed them and adapted them and sent them to you so that you can use them in your own communities as well in terms of discussion points. Um, and you want to use them in, in different settings, in classrooms and so forth. So that's why I, I sent them to you as well. So hopefully they can not only just help for creating awareness now, but to just help some further facilitation and, and conversation. So let's continue. We've got half an hour before we need to break. And I just want to finish the first half of our lecture. So the first component I said that is about a gender injustice was binary gender framework. The second one that's connected to that is the question of and the issue of privilege. Now, patriarchy as a social system is centered around privilege. And remember, I say patriarchy is not only about a few men, it's about the system that almost everyone keeps in check. So what is privilege? Privilege is unearned advantages and accesses to resources. It's expectations related to how you will be treated, namely entitlement, you will be treated differently than others. It's about protection from experiencing certain social problems. So you switch off your mind because, and you switch off your senses because you know that doesn't uh, uh, affect you. So uh, you are, in a sense, 
privilege you are pri privileged because you are protected you are able to switch off your mind and say oh but that's got nothing to do with me privilege is about having a more a, a larger range of choices and um privilege you are privileged if you're usually part of the dominant group however once we get to the intersectionality we'll see there are of course nuances of privilege and this is influenced by intersectionality and for example, many who are part of marginalized groups experience both oppression and privilege. White Afrikaans women, there was a study done by Christy van der Westhuizen, a prominent um, sociopolitical uh, researcher in our country. And um, she did a study on white Afrikaans women in South Africa. And she realized that women, these women in South Africa are both the oppressor because um, they did oppress um, and they took part in this whole scheme of apartheid. But because they are the women they are and they, they had the roles assigned to them, they were the oppressed as well. So there are different nuances of privilege. And privilege and oppression is about power dynamics. Usually it's about an imbalance in power. And this is where I want to go back to some of the things I did last year just briefly and ask you to look at this briefly with me and consider what we call the power suitcase. Now, for some of you, this might be familiar, and I did discuss it in my uh, lecture on Friday as well. Look at the different pictures. These are pictures that were uh, illustrated after a study that was conducted in Stellenbosch University, and it comes from that center there. And they did empirical studies in terms of how um, uh, households would view this issue. And there, for example, you see a figure depicting a woman and a man in each of the pictures. And there you see what is he's holding. He's holding a suitcase and in his hand is the power. Now then you see in the middle one, the wife has the power, but this should not challenge in any way the position of the man as master of the house. So she's got maybe a little power. In the first one, she's got nothing. In the second one, she's got a little bit, but look at the suitcase, it's much smaller. The third, it portrays something about the effects of it. In other words, using the power suitcase, see what happens if it's in your hands. Um, and look at that uh, caption at the bottom. What made the man look at himself as superior to the woman is that the man was considering the woman as inferior to him. Now, this is a direct consequence of a binary, bend, uh, a, a binary gender construction. And then the ideal is the one on the right hand side. And part of your reflection when we get to that a bit later would be on if you've got any experiences of something of the right hand picture or if your experiences are more in terms of the first picture, the middle one, or the third one as well. Now, while you have this whole picture of the power suitcase in your hand, let's look a little bit about the theory of power, for example, and different power um, dynamics, because privilege is about an imbalance in the power dynamics. So, once you start to recognize the components of gender injustice, the third one is power. So where the first one was binary gender construction, the second one was privilege, and the third one is power. Now, what you've seen in those pictures mostly is the first one, power over. Power over people, the way in which one's own intentions are enforced over the intentions of others. It always has negative and harmful consequences. And it limits the agency of those subjected to it in the forms of domination, oppression, and subordination. But just let's stand here for still for a moment and connect this to the issue of privilege. Privilege is an invisible form in some senses of power because it provides you an agency over people that you did not earn. You've got access to resources. The moment you've got access to resources, you have got access to more choices. It means um, some social problems don't affect you. How does that influence your own demeanor, your way of being, your life, your decisions, your actions um, in relation to people who do not have? Are you aware of, of your privilege? Uh, do you know what influence it exacts in your life? Um, or are we most of the time invisible to it? We are unaware of it. So the second power dynamic which can exist is power two. And that is something that takes place in the middle picture. But again, the middle picture had a big power suitcase and a small power suitcase. And power two in its basic form um, says that it's about the restoration or acknowledgement of the agency to act autonomously. 
but there's still a problem with that in the in in the um the respect that power then needs to be given to someone it's it's acknowledged <clears throat> it's not a recognition that someone has sorry <clears throat> their own agency it's rather about magnanimously saying oh but here's a little bit for you we will um view you as a human being we will give you the right to make your own choices we will um give you the space and allow you the privilege of choosing your job and your life partner, et cetera. And once again, right throughout this lecture, I hope you hear that I'm speaking in terms of masculinity and femininity in terms of that generally, uh, gender binary. However, everything that does not fit into a sort of constructed social norm, heteronorm, in terms to use one of the uh, three H's, um, is on the receiving end of oppression and subordination so women are definitely and statistics show but for example someone who is transgender someone that does not fit into the binary of either masculine or feminine all of them are experiencing um different levels of the same aspect so magnanimously we are going to recognize you now whereas recognizing someone's moral agency and freedom to act should not be a privilege it should be a right however we accord it in the terms of a privilege the ideal on the right hand side, the small little picture, is power with, which is an approach for collective resistance, an approach for individual empowerment, no imbalance in power. Power with is the human ability to act in concert. Now, it would be interesting if you start reflecting about this, if you would be able to identify any situations of a power with. Most of us, I think, will say there's power over and a lot in my context, power too, but this very much relates to overt and covert forms of, of discrimination, etc. And we'll get to that in a moment. I'm just checking the time as well. So this is an awareness exercise, but for this one, we're not going to do breakout dreams. I'm going to read the questions with you on the screen, and there are eight of them. And you are briefly going to take a piece of pen and paper and you are just going to quickly jot down the ones that apply to you as you read them. So I'm going to read them with you and I'm going to give you two minutes and then you are going to write down. This is an exercise of becoming aware of your privilege. So write down the number of each that apply to you. So some might have a yes or a no. So mainstream media, radio, film, news, YouTube, etc. represents you. You can watch or listen to any of it and find shows with people who look like you and represent your lifestyle. Is that the case for you or not? So yes or no. You are able to buy cosmetics and products that match your skin tone without having to go to a special shop. Yes or no. I put them in brackets flesh color. I remind myself of a student in the second year I was teaching theological anthropology who was a black woman um, and uh, she recounted how her teacher in primary school learned her the one color of the one coloring pencil and it was called flesh color. The color of the pencil was a beige. So flesh color was beige. So um, this really is part of one's, you know, in, in terms of uh, the way that one is aware or either unaware of your privilege. The teacher was not. So does number two apply to you? Number three, your religious holidays are recognized by your community or context um, with the closure of schools and business. Does that apply to you? Number four, you do not have to hide your relationship with your partner. Number five, you are rarely asked where you are from. Number six, you are not afraid to call the police. Number seven, you do not have to prepare your child on how to deal with discrimination. Number eight, You've never been told by a stranger to smile. I've been told by a stranger to smile so many times in shops, on the campus. And it's mostly guys saying, why don't you smile? You know, I don't know them from any place, but that, that has happened to me, for example. So please just take one minute, one and a half minute, just read through those and quickly jot down the ones that apply to you. I'm going to do the same. And then we're quickly going to hear some feedback from you. The, the point of these exercises is to gradually make you more aware 
of the components of gender injustice. So the first level was thinking about how this functions in your society. The second level was adding the privilege layer to it. So I'm, I'm very happy to um, hear your responses, but keep in mind that throughout our lecture, uh, and we all know we are about 10 minutes from, from breaking, so I'm just gonna make a few final remarks of some of the slides before we break. Remember this awareness must build upon one another. And this is only the start of this process. So another level of awareness is the amount of things you would be able to connect with on this list and the ones that you cannot and why. And um, all of these things uh, contribute to, to um, is, is examples of privilege and how uh, this exacerbates, you know, um, the issue of gender injustice. So the fourth issue uh, or the fourth components of gender injustice. So far we did gender binary frameworks. We did... Um, um, we did privilege and we are doing sexism. I've even forgot my second one now. I can't remember. That's, that's really um, bad if you start um, to forget the second one in, in your list. So we're at number four. Oh, that's, of course, privilege. Gender uh, binary framework, uh, privilege, power, and now we're at sexism. Now I'm going to finish this slide and then after the break I will um, continue. Now what we're going to do now in this next slide or two or three sort of to, sort of starts to um, um, create a deepening uh, level of awareness in terms of the things that you said so far. For example, the gender roles that you have assigned and the list of privilege that you've just experienced and said. Because the reason for that is simply that um, when it comes to the specific com components of gender justice, it's like a measuring tool to see how aware or unaware you are of in terms of the type of language you use, the uh, binary constructs that you maybe practice, etc. So sexism in its definition is prejudice and discrimination against someone based on their gender. And this might also be someone that is based on, uh, on, on someone's gender identity, which does not fit into the binary, okay? This definition applies to all genders. It is connected to stereotyping and therefore a binary gender framework. Within a patriarchal society, sexism justifies and rationalizes male um, domination. Sexism is domination, and paternalistic and it is patronizing and this is where I really want to try and create the deepest level of awareness that I'm possibly able to do in an hour and a half yeah and then later on. What happens through sexism is that gender hierarchy is maintained and um, in this feminist handbook that I've mentioned so far um, Bagshaw distinguishes between three forms of sexism Hostile sexism, benevolent sexism, and internalized sexism. And I must be honest, before I read this, I've never had such a clear tool, an instrument, to be able to describe what I've experienced and what I've witnessed that others have experienced. Three forms of sexism, the hostile, the benevolent, and the internalized one. And sexism in this regard, people listening to us today is the single most insidious, subtle, invisible, but very harmful and pervasive, widely and deeply embedded components of gender injustice. Sexism is the worst component of all of these things because in its hostile forms, you can recognize it, but in its benevolent forms, you can't recognize it. And that leads to internalized sexism. And I'm gonna give you examples of each of these three. And an awareness exercise at the end of the section is going to ask you to think about examples of the different ones. So I'm not going to go too fast. I'm going to look at each of the different types of sexism there is, and we're going to discuss that in detail. Now, I think we've got five minutes left, Nora, is that correct? Okay. So because we've got five minutes left, I think I'm going to start with the first form of sexism, which is the hostile one. Okay, remember hostile, benevolent, and internalized. Now, sexism, a hostile sexism, is an expression of hostility toward mostly women, but of course, everyone that does not fit into the binary. Okay, manifests in demeaning, derogatory, and aggressive attitudes towards women, anyone else who challenges male superiority because sexism is connected to the patriarchal framework and the binary. 
Hostile sexism is easy to spot. Look at the following examples. Women exaggerate their problems. Women use their bodies to get power. Women always want special treatment. Women are manipulative. Now, um, I think from those four, um, I've heard three of them numerous times, um, in, uh, unfortunately, in, in a variety of contexts. So once again, if I can just continue, go back to um, the previous slide. Sexism is trying to keep the hierarchical gender construction in, in, in its place. Gender hierarchy is maintained through it, and it's connected to stereotyping and a binary gender framework, those three things. And now you can say, yes, hostile sexism, yes, it's bad, and we've seen that, and that's horrible, and it's, it's everywhere. But once we get to benevolent sexism, this is much harder. And some of you, when you responded in terms of the gender binary, the um, awareness exercise, you actually mentioned some of these examples. And what I want to show now is how the examples that you've mentioned is also a form of sexism, even though you would think it's not. That's how this type of thing works. Benevolent sexism is an expression of attitudes toward women which seem positive in nature. In actuality, these expressions are patronizing and aimed at restricting women's roles. Remember, this is something where some, you think someone would say something nice about you, but actually it's demeaning you because it's restricting your role. And I'm going to give examples. This relates to idealizing women by considering them to be nurturers or intuitive. Benevolent sexism is much harder to spot and address. It can come across as a compliment on the surface, but underneath the comment like sex lies sexist beliefs that maintain patriarchal power. It offers women protection if they maintain or they comply with the status quo. For example, have you ever been experiencing or heard the following examples? Women deserve men's protection. Women should be put on a pedestal. Women are more organized than men, therefore they are better suited for administrative work. I think this is something that Mary Louise referred to in terms of the different jobs. Women are neater than men and therefore better suited for household chores. Women are natural caregivers. Now, I see we've got two minutes left. I just want to make a few comments and then we'll stop. If you look at those examples, listening to them outright or hearing them outright, if someone says that you are neat, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, I would be happy if someone says that. I really want to be neat and I like to be organized because I don't like to get into a room where there's stuff all over the place. But has that got anything to do with the fact that I'm a woman? Has it got anything to do with the fact that I should then be only doing that? Okay. Women should be put on a pedestal. I remember a few years ago, one of my colleagues, she's not working here anymore. She was a student with me, undergrad study, and she also became a minister in the church, but she's doing other work now. She worked here for a short while. And I remember that one of my other colleagues, uh, she used to go with him because she worked with him. They used to go to meetings together. So they would drive together with one another all the time. Mostly she would drive with him. And um, she was um, clued up about these types of sexism, although I, don't, I wouldn't know if she would, knew, she would know the different names for it. He opened the day for, uh, he, uh, he, he got into the practice of opening the car door for her. So when they would drive somewhere, he would open the door for her. And she put up a huge uh, debate about it and she reacted quite aggressively towards it. And I remember him coming to me and saying, yes, but what must we now do? Women are never satisfied about anything. And what's wrong with opening the door for her? The point is, there's probably nothing wrong with opening the door for her, except if it comes from that second example from the top. Women should be put on a pedestal. Benevolent sexism is insidious because it's invisible and it's pervasive because it's embedded. And once you are on the receiving ends of these type of things, which make you feel special, what actually happens is you internalize sexism. Because yes, women are natural caregivers. So it doesn't that mean I've got a special ability to do this, so I should be doing this. That's one thing, it becomes a problem once these are used to categorize and hierarchize anything that people do. And this relates to the gender binary. So let's leave you with that. When we come back, I'm going to recap quickly the, the, the other two types of sexism, and then I'm going to show how this specific one 
comes back to um, uh, results in internalized sexism. So Nora, I'm going to stop sharing now. I don't know if you are going to stop the recording, but uh, we can probably stop and just pick up. So. Exactly, we will do so. And there are also a few questions also appearing in the chat, but maybe we can look at them later on. It started now. Great. Um, thank you, everyone. Welcome back after the short break. I know these breaks are always much shorter than when one would want them to be, but it's just about getting ourselves refreshed to be able to continue because I realize that the subject matter that we are busy with is very dense and it's complicated and it's a lot of information. That's why I try to build in these different uh, little um, awareness exercises. However, I saw while you were on break, that one of the comments was in terms of that there's not enough time for discussion. There's never enough time for discussion. I do realize that um, in attempting to pack out this theme, I try to incorporate as many different strands to try to weave a whole picture. Because usually when I do these things, I only tackle one or two of these issues. Today, I decided to tackle all of them. And these awareness exercises in this regard then is to just start the conversation. And that's why I'm so happy that Nora emailed them to you, because this means you can take this for further reflection. Um, we will never be able to discuss all of that. I sometimes think I should just leave uh, any content off the table and just put out one uh, list of questions and just talk about that and nothing, nothing else. But I want to strike the balance. So what I'm thinking now going forward in the second part of the lecture is um, I will make less use of the breakout rooms and see if we can not try and answer them in the bigger group and try to save a little bit of time because I do realize once you get into a group there's this issue about who speaks first and all of that and that also that takes time so I'm going to try and work a little bit on that that's the first remark I want to make and the second remark is regarding to the issue of benevolent sexism now, so there was a question in terms of that, and I think I'd like to answer that once I've finished with the whole scheme of sexism, and then maybe give two or three minutes just for some reflection, and then I'll continue. So just hold that question or that remark for a moment, and let's just see how benevolent sexism leads to internalized sexism. And I think basically that will answer the question, but we will reflect on that. So you are most welcome. Thanks for the remarks in terms of your um, the things you reflect on the privilege questions. That, of course, is also a very excellent uh, awareness exercise. And um, in part of that book, I'm going to start sharing now. Part of that book actually um, has got a um, space at the bottom of your list uh, to be able to put your own experiences of privilege there. So, I mean, take that and use that in your communities and add your own examples. And, and let's talk about it again. I'll keep on using that in the lectures I teach as well. So to recap, we are looking at the fourth component of gender injustice, which is uh, sexism taken together with uh, uh, binary gender frameworks and privilege power, and then the fourth one here. Now, hostile sexism is usually the one that is the easiest to spot, and it's the one that most people have got problems with because they can see it. And, um, they can recognize it and they've got a reaction to it. But benevolent sexism is much harder to spot, therefore it's harder to react against because if you're on the receiving end of this, you want to ask yourself all the time, but am I not allowed to receive a compliment? Um, and then as your levels of awareness start to deepen, you will start to realize that some of these so-called compliments are carefully structured to keep you in your place. For example, Let's take the one about carrying someone's bags. Now I'm saying carrying someone's bags, but the comment that we had in the um, comment section was, is someone not allowed to carry a woman's load or open the door for her? My question in that regard would be to help you create awareness. Why are you helping her? Uh, would you help a man? Um, and maybe you would say now you would, but your, your instinctive reaction, also based on what I read in the comment section, is um, very much aimed towards why can't you help a woman? Would you help someone else in the same way if you see people carrying a lot of packages walking down a road? Would you immediately stop and offer them help, no matter what gender they are? If someone is struggling to walk up a hill and you can see they don't have a car and they've got far to drive, uh, would you stop and offer them a lift based on what? 
What is the reason that you're doing that? It's not about questioning the action in itself because it might come from a good place, but that's the problem with benevolent sexism because you always think it comes from a, bad, a good place. But what it's actually based on is a deeper framework of binary gender. And therefore it's a good um, awareness exercise to ask yourself in which situations and to who people, which type of people you would do this. Um, a man, for example, the colleague I spoke of would not open the door for a man. I know this because I know this person very well. And I had this follow-up conversation with him. And this all goes together with a second example from the top. Women should be put on a pedestal. And I'm going to give you my own short example of benevolent sexism to try and illustrate something that is even more insidious. So a few years ago, thinking seven years ago, um, we had our general assembly, one of them for my specific church tradition. And I was put uh, to work in a specific committee because all of us are divided up to different work. So, of course, I uh, spent a lot of time because our committee's work was to sort of make a summary of every day's decisions for the next day. And the General Assembly is over five days. So our committee would work um, after the meeting has ended, probably at five or six o'clock at night, and we would work for another two or three hours. So at the end of the General Assembly, one of the um, group, uh, the ministers, the male minister, which I worked with, started texting me. And in the beginning, it was just like, hello, how you are, and, and all of that. And I just responded friendly. Um, in, um, in the same day, later at that night, he texted me and said, he's lying in bed and he's thinking about me. Now I was thinking, OK, what should I do about this and how should I respond to it? Because... As you will see, benevolent sexism leads to internalized sexism. So as a woman, should I know what, do, what should I do with this? Um, I immediately felt uncomfortable and I decided to recognize and honor that feeling. So I did not respond. It escalated very quickly. So within um, three days from that specific moment, I received 45 text messages from him in one day. Even though I had ignored him, and one of the main principles of sexual harassment is you are allowed to ignore uh, something if it's not wanted, and that should be enough, but it wasn't enough. Um, in the end, it uh, took um, my male colleagues, this is the system I'm in, to tell him to stop, and then he stopped. Okay, this is, this is outright sexism and sexual harassment. What my experience of benevolent sexism was the following. So our general assembly takes place every um, four years, so four years after that, um, we get the different um, groups and the committees for the, for the next General Assembly. I see that I'm once again put with him in a committee to do the same work. So I phoned the organizer because I didn't say anything to anyone, um, I've, except to the two people that helped me sort out the situation. So I phoned the organizer of the committees and I uh, tell him, with a lot of anger and tears in my voice, because of course, being internalized, I'm ashamed of it as well, um, and tell him the situation and ask him to not put me in a committee with him. His reaction is a classic form of benevolent sexism, although I didn't know it at the time. His reaction was as follows. What are you telling me? This is so shocking. Don't worry, I won't put you in a committee with him. I will protect you from doing that work. So I was thinking, okay, that's nice. I'm waiting to hear if he's going to condemn that person's actions. He did not. So instead of saying that was wrong, he said, no, I'll protect you from it. And in itself, people, that is not such a, it's not the worst reaction. And that's the problem with this type of form of sexism, because you would receive it and experience it as protection, as a compliment. But he never said what that minister did was wrong. And that's the problem. That's why it's so insidious. That is my, the moment I read this, that was my example. And I think I, I should share that with you because it's an uh, example of how this in practice works. And I'm sure that you might have other examples as well. But now to go on to what um, internalized sexism is, the danger, the real danger of benevolent sexism is internalized. What happens if it's internalized? Women have gotten so used to benevolent sexism, which might seem well-intentioned and affectionate. So it's brushed off, off as harmless, okay? Um, women are the natural nurturers. Women know what they should do. They are good with household work. They are good with administration, etc., etc. 
So what happens if it's brushed off as harmless is it is accepted as part of women's lives because it is seemingly mild. It's not that bad. So that leads to a type of a question. What's the big deal if society thinks I'm nicer or neater than I am? What is the effect? Women think that this type of sexism does not have to be managed and they let it go. It makes them believe they really do not have it that bad. And I promise you, I've had this exact conversation, these four steps in my mind a million times, a million times. I had it last week when a male colleague expressed to me that he thinks I'm smelling so nice because I love perfume. So when he comes into my office, he always says, I smell nice. And then I always have to ask myself, what do I do? Because I like to smell that way. How do I receive it from him? I don't like it. So what do I do? It's not that bad. Women, are, you know, if, if I think back to the whole privilege thing, it means I make this whole list and say to myself, yes, but there are much worse things. That's the problem. That's how it starts. Because benevolent sexism is internalized. The moment I internalize it, I start to think, I believe the sexist messages. I believe the stereotyping. And this affects women's self-esteem, but the thing that it affects even more is the way that women view and treat each other. So someone that will be uh, critical of some of the examples of benevolent sexism. Most people would say, okay, the hostile sexism is not on, that's wrong. Benevolent sexism, much harder to spot. So what happens is women who look at other women who express um, concern and critique against examples of benevolent sexism, like you are a natural mother, you are a natural nurturer, etc. They are criticized by other women because those women are upsetting the status quo. They are being too critical. They are not recognizing that they don't have it that bad. This is the insidious and the harmful effects of this. And I think I cannot explain this fully in this time allotted to me, but I really think that this threefold um, uh, type of separation in terms of the different types of sexism is a helpful scheme to be able to look at your own situation and see and, and judge your own reactions to it and develop a response towards it. And of course, people that are up to, that is up to yourself. And of course, it's influenced by your ethnicity, your context, your culture, your religion, all of these things absolutely play a role in the way you experience it and the way that you probably think that your response should be like. I'm just thinking that this is a necessary part of what uh, constitutes gender injustice uh, because it creates a level of awareness. You can do a million things in practice and do a lot of different um, studies and you can go to a lot of um, uh, trouble to design a research um, out a set and a structure but if you're not aware of this it means you're always gonna uh, uh, sort of skip a step in this because people do certain things in practice but what is the reason that they do that and I think that is basically the broad aim of, of today's lecture is really creating this uh, broad awareness so um the fifth component that goes very much with sexism, because it's the vehicle of it, is the one of language. Now, language is a component of gender justice because it is the vehicle in which this insidious, this invisible but harmful system and binary frameworks are perpetuated. So language is the car that takes the sexism from one point to the other. It, it spreads it, okay? Now, mainly um, this type of uh, thing comes in two forms. And once again, language is such a prominent and a scary part of um, gender injustice because it's equally insidious, because we don't even realize the effect of the metaphors and the language we use. Because once again, we accept it as if it was always there, not as if it's developed in a certain context or a construct. The first form um, language issues comes in is the gender exclusive language in relation to humanity and to the divine. So the argument usually is that gender exclusive language is inclusive. Um, namely that mankind represents humankind, man means human, and God as father, groom or king is an overarching metaphor that includes all other metaphorical language. In the 29, Jane Stout wrote, I think, one of the best critiques against this type of argument. Um, and her study was titled, When He Does Not Mean You. 
And she illustrated how gender exclusive language is a form of ostracism, which ostracism is exclusion or banishment. Because mankind does not mean humankind, man does not mean human. Uh, those words are words with specific meaning attributed to them, and therefore they cannot be used as if they include. Because in the same argument, you would be able to say, well, if that's the case, why can I not use womankind to express humankind? Why can I not use women to express all humanity? And why can I not use God as mother to include that? This argument usually goes right back to the Genesis creation narratives in um, uh, Christianity, at least. And that's why I started with that, because that really is the root of a gender framework, binary one, that leads to all sorts of things. And one of it is to gender exclusive language. The philosopher Pierre Bourdieu showed that language has got few main functions. It's a system for communication. It's the instruments of power and it legitimizes conduct. So it empowers and strengthens your identity. And what happens with language? And this is something that's sometimes very much missed. There's a two-way movement between language and reality. Language is used to describe our reality, okay? And then reality becomes the fountain or the source for our language. And then when, when it comes to binary gender construction, then language becomes like a super spreader of sexism. And I know that you know the term super spreader today because we are in a pandemic. So we understand what, how bad a super spreader is and we understand the notion. And language becomes a super spreader of sexism because it's something that we're not aware of, because we think it's harmless, because, um, you know, a certain thing might include something else as well. It doesn't work like that. It simply doesn't because if we say that language is used to describe our reality, we've got certain words and terms to describe what we experience. But what if the words and the terms we use to describe that experience is much more and much wider than maybe the two or three that we have? Who's to say that the words that we use can describe the whole of that reality? That's the problem. And once that those few words that we use to describe the reality, that becomes the reality. So if we use mankind and man in terms of God and in terms of humanity and we use it enough then that becomes the fountain for our language in other words that's the way that we use to describe reality in the end because it becomes our reality and in that way language becomes a super spreader of sexism and this and the benevolent sexism is probably the ones that are the most difficult to spot. It's the ones that there are the most debate about. And it's because it's all related to a gender binary framework. And that's why I try to link these five things that I've done so far. The other example of how language is a super spreader for sexism is in the metaphors and the language imagery we use. And the ones I know is the ones now in English, but there are ones in my native language, my own uh, language, which is Afrikaans. But of course, you would have other ones in your different languages as well. For example, to run like a girl is considered a derogative thing. To throw like a girl, to cry like a girl, to play like a girl. It's all things you, when you say that to someone, you mean something bad. Okay? Don't be a sissy. That is something that you hear in many uh, cultures and languages. It means don't be a wimp. Okay? Don't be soft. Don't be weak. It's very much connected to a patriarchal and a normative and a heteronormative way of thinking about what masculinity is. Bridezilla, I hate that word because I read it a lot. Women who are supposedly difficult when they are busy getting ready for their wedding are called bridezillas, but they aren't the same type of names for the men as well. That's why you get many times women described in terms of cat or dragon or bitch or anything like that in that regard. Maybe you can think of some. Metaphors are not linked in this way only to women. Anyone outside the binary has the meaning language connected to it. So a man who would uh, exhibit, sorry, so-called feminine characteristics are ostracized in the same way. And Edwin Zulu in his article, his chapter about uh, culture and the, uh, the uh, men behind those masks, he actually uh, exactly says this. And this for me is uh, ironic in a way, because we place a lot of emphasis, especially in the global South, on decolonial and post-colonial perspectives, which is about 
emphasizing how language is something that excludes people. If you can't speak English, then you are excluded. And uh, post-colonial and decolonial uh, perspectives and scholarship fight against this. So they recognize the power of language. But when it comes to a debate about the grammar, the building blocks, the framework of the language, suddenly that's not such a big deal. And that's why this is so um, ironic to me, because we realize worldwide that language is a way to include or exclude people, but it's also a way to uphold sexism, and it's also a way to uphold your privilege and patriarchy and the binary gender framework. And I think almost in that way, if we start talking about decolonial and post-colonial perspectives about language, it immediately includes looking at the um, way that language uh, keeps gender constructs in place by way of gender exclusive language when it comes to religion and the everyday metaphors and language imagery that we use. And I know there's a bunch of remarks coming through. I can't see them, which I'm a little bit happy about because I don't want to um, see them while I do this discussion and I'll, I'll get to them later on. So here is your third awareness exercise. And because uh, some of our previous conversations might have taken up so much time, I think I'm going to go through these questions with you one by one, and then I'll stop sharing a moment, and then we'll take about five minutes or so for question because dividing into groups also takes time. And so we'll discuss these things in the bigger group, but I really urge you to use these in future in your own communities. So now we looked at um, our first awareness exercise was about the binary framework. The second was one that was about privilege. Now the third one is about sexism and gender exclusive language. Now look, let's look at the first question. Consider your context and see if you can think of one example of hostile sexism and one example of benevolent sexism that you've experienced or witnessed or expressed yourself. How did it make you feel? Think for a moment on that. Just think where you are, where you are sitting. I'm going to read the question again. Just think. Consider your context and see if you can think of an example of hostile sexism or an example of benevolent sexism. Okay, even if you didn't experience it, maybe you witnessed it. How did that make you feel? Think for yourself how that made you feel at that moment. Did you see it? Did you not see it? When you saw it, if you didn't see it, maybe you think you didn't. Uh, maybe you don't know what you witnessed. Maybe you don't know what to do with it. Maybe it made you feel awful. Maybe it was something that you used yourself and you didn't, uh, wasn't aware about the possible effect it could have. The second question in terms of helping you to become aware of this is consider the times you heard the expression, she's a good woman or he is a good man. In the context that you heard it, what did it mean if you hear that? She's a good woman and he's a good man. What do you think about that? The third one is the University of Pretoria has recently adopted a trans protocol. Now, according to this protocol, uh, students will no longer be forced to state upon registration, miss or mister. There's also um, uh, uh, the possibility, uh, sorry, that's wrong. There is the possibility of using gender neutral pronouns. It's not not the possibility, that's the whole point. In other words, they don't have to add he or she, they can add they, for example, they can add the pronoun of their choice. What do you think about something like this? Do you think a step like this will help achieve gender justice? And finally, when you hear the words mankind or man in reference to humanity, what does it mean to you? Now, of course, I can spend a whole hour and a half only on these questions. However, this is meant to start the conversation So there are a few things that I just want to finish up before we get into another conversation. As you would have realized up to now, the intersectionality is one of the main aspects that links up to a lot of the things that you've said so far. So now we have looked at the five components of um, gender injustice. I want to look at some things that might help towards a component of gender justice in itself. Um, and that is... I think the first one is intersectionality. Now, one of the exercises I would want you to do later on, but I don't think we're going to get to that, but um, I provided the template for you, would be able to look on the left-hand side and that thing that looks like a flower and 
what the purpose is of something like that, because I've got an empty one in one of your slides, is that you would put the aspects of your identity that you think defines you the most in the middle and in the different circles around it, fill it in with the different things that intersect with that, exactly like those little circles cross each other over and there's darker gray pieces. There are light gray pieces and darker gray uh, pieces and the dark gray, uh, like almost like semicircles or something, is where all of these intersect, where they um, link with one another, where they overlap. And each of us will be able to fill in, in all those little tiny petals or circles of the flower, all the different things that intersect with our main identity. And this might change over time as well. This is extremely important exercise because recognizing this, I think, the way that different aspects of our identity intersect, I think is the greatest hurdle for moving from a possible or a problematic or a classist notion of sustainable, with emphasis on the word development, to flourishing because we've heard over and over again in so many discussions that a major part of the sustainable development conversation is the issue of what development refers to. And I think their intersectionality will help us in getting to a point of flourishing, a point of justice, also related to gender justice and equality, which is one of the sustainable development goals. Because once you recognize intersectionality, really you do. It means you are recognizing the privilege, the imbalance in power between different peoples, different races, different ethnicities, different geographical locations, and how all of this impacts on this whole discourse of sustainable development. So I really consider this one of the main aspects. We should do a lot more work on it. We should mention it a lot more. Uh, awareness exercises should start to much more about this. Sustainable development should focus much more on this. I think it does, but as explicit section within it, we can do a lot more in this regard. Uh, the term, just a little bit of theory, was uh, coined by Kimberly um, Crenshaw. Um, African-American, and she coined the term in 1967 in an employment discrimination case to show that a woman's experience of her gender cannot be separated from her race. And this means that her race exacerbates, in other words, deepens some of the experiences of being a woman. So intersectionality is about different aspects of how one's identity intersects, and it indicates how multiple levels of oppression can reinforce one another, okay? So a white man's experience will be different than a, a black man's experience, will be different from a white woman's, will be different from a black woman, will be different from a black woman living in uh, Brazil uh, or a black woman living in, uh, South, uh, in, 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 this, in some of the states in the United States, a black woman living in South Africa, for example. Um, all of these different things will have an influence. And intersectionality is an important instrument, I think, to understand how each individual group or individual or group experiences their fight for equality and equity because these things um, have a direct link to your understanding of equality and how it relates to equity because it relates to justice. So the other the second component of what I think um, of gender justice after intersectionality is, of course, looking a brief, uh, briefly about the different types of justices that we actually consider. I mean, justice generally is about where social relationships are in a moral balance. Uh, that is when justice occurs. But there are a lot of theory and a lot of work on what justice would mean. And um, the classic, one of the classic ways to look at it was John Rawls' um, theory about the two principles of justice, which is liberty and equal opportunity. So when those two things are present, that is when justice takes place. Now, remember, when we talk about this, this links up with all of the things that we said are the components of gender injustice. If justice is liberty and equal opportunity, how does that come to play in terms of a binary framework, in terms of our language, in terms of sexism, in terms of privilege and power. All those five things link up directly with a notion of justice, because if those things, the way those things are present or not, uh, influences um, freedom and equal of opportunity. And I think therefore it's necessary to look a little bit deeper just into what feminist work has conducted on injustice because there are a range of injustices and they, this is of course connected directly to intersectionality. So one of the types of justice is relational and distributive justice. And the question there would be what would constitute just relationships 
amongst all genders? How would fair distributions of benefits and burdens, responsibilities and opportunities look like? Imagine if, imagine as context, a situation, how would that look like? Fair distributions of benefits and burn it, uh, burdens. So you suffer equally and you work equally hard and but you get equal benefits, all of them. So you share in that. Responsibilities, equal responsibilities and opportunities. Think about relating this to a binary framework and sexism in terms of who reaps benefits, who's got burdens, what type of responsibilities are they, who is, what type of responsibilities are assigned to who, who's got uh, what type of opportunities. In feminist work, there's also a retributive justice, and that's in that type of justice, it's focused on how wrongdoing should be punished. Reparative justice is how to compensate for or repair past wrongs. And of course, this type of justice conversation is very much part of uh, decolonial and post-colonial discussions as well. Transitional justice focuses on how best to address the legacies of human rights abuses. And epistemic justice is something that I did last year. It's about how to address hierarchy and epistemology and knowledge, which of course is also very much important for the sustainable development debate. So that's just like a bird's eye view of the complexity of justice in itself. So justice is not just a word to throw around, it's a complex aspect and it might mean different things for different people depending on their different contexts. Um, I'm just going to go briefly through this because some of this I have done previously, but one of the main components of gender justice together with um, uh, intersectionality and um, uh, e justice and equality, those three, um, relates to each other. So the third component of gender justice in that regard is equality. And this relates to justice as it is connected to freedoms of opportunities, freedom of rights, freedoms of responsibilities. And there are different definitions of equality. And um, usually um, equality is considered a modern value, which links up with modern social citizenship. So in other words, if you are considered a human being and you are part of a considered a, a citizen, citizen is not only citizen of a country, it's of course, in all the ways that you've got the capacity to act as a human being and enact choices on different levels. Um, defining equality um, must take place in that regard in conjunction with the process of including the diversity of others to participate equally. So the fact that equality is understood as something that links up with model, modern social citizenship is about including a diversity of others to participate equally in defining what equality even is. Um, in an e equality of opportunity, two main aspects are usually the foundation of equality. It's cultural recognition and democratic inclusion. So when it comes to equality, understanding and how equality is related to both justice and intersectionality, two things are important. The first, the democratic inclusion means you are able to participate in um, decision making. Another form of equality has got to do with cultural recognition, and this is the recognition of differences. So overarching, looking at the concept of equality relating to justice and to intersectionality, it basically means sharing of burdens and sharing of benefits and most important recognizing of the difference recognizing of the different layers layers that make up someone's identity and therefore there's this whole um theoretical study that has um, been taking place for quite a while in terms of re um, recognizing difference what is called the politics of recognition it's about appreciating and recognizing how we are different from one another. Um, and once again, to get back to the very first statements I made when I talked about binary gender framework, um, it's never about um, not acknowledging differences. In actual fact, part of justice is very much acknowledging just, uh, differences, but part of justice is not placing those differences on a hierarchy. Uh, injustice is, um, adding value or connecting value to those differences and placing them on a scale from top to bottom, saying one type of difference is more important than another. And there you've got some of the theorists that have worked on that, but it's basically about the recognition of the unique identity of everyone. 
and the public acknowledgements of the particular worth of each one is non-negotiable. So this is getting back to the power suitcase. This is about not in a way magnanimously giving someone the power suitcase. It's acknowledging that everyone has got um, equal opportunity and unique ways to contribute to what it means to be human in all the different levels of what that means. And that is in its very core what this type of equality does um, consider or does think about. But then the question is, of course, and this I'm going to look at in this slide. I'm not going to do a discussion now, but I want to look at with you at this. When we start thinking about equality, um, one of the main things usually in discussion, think back to that first um, slide where I had the quotes by Harriet Tubman where she said she see across the line she sees a bunch of she sees all these women and they are inviting her to come but there's a lot of things that stops her to get from to that line um the classic example that was used i first heard that uh, quote um when viola davis received her oscar for a role um and i think it was one of the movies or other it was for that series that she plays and viola davis is an african-american actress in the northern uh, in, in, in the United States and um, she referred to Harriet Tubman when she won an award because she said she cannot win an award if there's not an opportunity for a play to roll like she did and the role that she could play uh, was in terms of being a black woman in America and if roles are not written for people to do then she can't do it and therefore she can't win a prize for that and that is why she recognized or quoted Harriet Tubman because it's one thing to say everyone is open why don't you just come but look at that little picture on the left hand side in terms of equality and equity and usually it's about the different types of justice that is needed when it comes to gender uh, equality and gender justice for example equality on the left hand side would say everyone is equal and look at where those different people are the one at the bottom on the right hand side can still not see over the fence over the line as it were equity proposes that someone gets what they need in that situation to be able to be on that equal level so looking at that you might say that um, equity is better as equality but what in actual fact is the case is that the one is needed for the other to take place the one cannot take place without the other um, because um, to be able to be equal, to be able to look at this, have equal opportunities, there are some things that needs to happen for that to be able to take place, to get to that point of equality. So the one actually enforces the other and helps the other one become a reality. And this relates very much to how you would consider your intersectional um, um, identity. And this is the one exercise now I'm not going to do with you now. Um, I think this is something that you can do on your own. The other questions were actually more related to what we were doing this morning. So if you would use this image on the right hand side, you would typically fill in your main identity there. And it's a nice exercise to do with yourself. I've been doing it for about five or six or seven years with some of my students. Uh, when we do the anthropology class or the uh, sexuality, ethics of sexuality class, and it's very interesting to see where they find themselves on that spectrum and to help them create awareness of their own experiences to see where that intersect. And that's why I think that's a very nice um, exercise for you to do on your own time as well. So now we start to get into the final part of our lecture today. So now I put on the components of what I think gender injustice is. I briefly considered the components of what I think gender justice is, um, that is equality and justice and intersectionality. Now I want to get into the final section in terms of, now we've looked at all these theory and we've seen this, what does this mean? What do I do about all of this? Is there some things that we can do in a community? How would this work? In a 2012 study titled, sorry, Sex and World Peace, uh, which was done by Hudson and a few other scholars. There are about five um, uh, researchers involved in that study. They linked sexual and gender-based violence, that's SGBV, at a micro level to um, um, a macro level. So violence at a micro level is linked to violence at a macro level, which they say it starts at that level and then it goes down to the other level. During their research, 
they constructed a, a possible few answers or hypotheses, which is intended to answer this question. How did male dominated social structures develop throughout human cultures? So the question is, how did male dominated social structures develop throughout human cultures and throughout decades? And some of their hypotheses, some of their possible answers to how this could have happened includes the following. They've got a whole list. I just took six or seven from them. Number one, how male dominated social structures developed throughout human cultures is that male dominance hierarchies organize male protection of the group. Um, and that is one of the main reasons why uh, globally women struggle to work together to achieve gender justice. There are numerous studies that show that in this regard, um, men are able to work more better together uh, in, in protecting this type of structure than women are at working together at protesting against that. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a bunch of uh, studies that shows that. The second one, violence is used when it is functional and when it re and, and its rewards are frequent and immediate. That's how this male-dominated social structure develops and is kept intact. Imitation of aggression against girls or women, girls and women begins early in life. That's one of the reasons how this develops throughout human cultures. Lack of female affiliation results in women's allegiance to male authority. Some of the examples that Janine has mentioned. Structural violence is based on cultural violence. That is open or implicit violence in private spheres. spheres. That is why one of the main aspects when it comes to gender studies is always saying that the personal is political. Um, because what happens in the private sphere is not uh, a private in that regard. It's got other results and leads to, um, uh, uh, um, it's got more public uh, uh, causes. And gendered hierarchies are at the root of structural inequality, group identities and patriarchal nationalism. This is very important. The last uh, thing, patriarchal nationalism in terms of a type of nationalism we see these days all the more, which is focused on uh, keeping binaries intact. Um, and this is also in terms of political views, etc. It's not only about religious views and views regarding human beings, sexuality. It's about access and progress and all of that. So in this study, they said these are some of the ways that this male-dominated social structure develops and is kept intact. Their conclusion is surprising. They say that any future clash of nations will be between those who they treat women as equal members of the human species and those that cannot or will not do so. So they say future um, conflicts will be waged on the basis of who um, uh, treats women as equal members of the human species. In terms of our binary gender framework that we discussed earlier, this would mean um, that uh, the future clash, uh, future conflicts between nations would be between those who can accept or understand at least um, gender diversity and those who cannot. Those who have transcended the gender binary framework and those who have not. That is their very interesting um, conclusion in that study. So then they identify critical areas for uh, action. They say preventing violence, the first critical area for action is preventing violence by making it dysfunctional, saying that it's wrong. And we say, yeah, but a lot of us, a lot of our governments do that. But don't they only do that occasionally? And um, they say part of this specific step of action is creating laws, enforcing them, and modifying the power of tradition, which is very important because tradition in a lot of settings have got like absolute say. The second area for action they identify is providing new patterns of thinking and acting that are more likely to keep gender conflicts from arising. Now, a gender protocol might be part of something like that or an example of that, for example. Helping other all people to internalize gender equality principles that are the basis of peaceful interactions with other sexes. This last one is once again extremely important because the way you help people to internalize gender equality principles is by start, is starting at a young age um, and um, helping them not positioning um, humanity into two opposite sides from birth and putting them in two groups that are supposed to clash to one another because that's what's currently happening. 
if you can just sort of try and help them to um, be on the same side at least for a few years before imprinting um, this binary framework on them, who knows where we will end up, for example. And ways to internalize gender equality principles might be through teaching in classrooms, teaching in religious communities, um, uh, and of course, looking at our language. And this goes to the second part of the um, explanation of why these areas are areas for action. Um, they recommend naming and renaming um, so those practices who, which might be accepted, um, which seems so-called harmless and mild, to reflect what they actually are. Naming is actually one of the core principles of feminist theory, to name something. The moment you can name something, you mean it's, it's real. If it's real, you can um, get a start to uh, uh, develop a response to it. For example, um, instead of just saying child marriage, which in voluntary marriage, which might sound a little bit, it's, it's, it sounds like it, what it is, but I mean, does it say what it really is? And their recommendation is um, describing that as crimes against humanity. Um, and then it's initiatives and imperatives to make maternal mortality, access to contraception and education for girls, part of government's top priorities. Um, to make national family law equitable is to, for example, raise the minimum age of marriage to 18, which our government is currently discussing in terms of the revamping of our marriage laws in South Africa. And one of the main, very important um, uh, reforming activities is to work within the grain of culture, and that would be involve men in reforming activities. But as Edwin Zulu has said, you can only take that can only take place if you can convince those power holders in the society that what they are doing is actually harmful. Um, yeah. So this is uh, another um, uh, awareness exercise which we're not going to go into now, but it would be. Uh, nice, this is something that Edwin Zulu has designed for you to think about and go into your own community and think about your own community and cultures, um, cultural practices and customs and uh, thinking about how long those have been there, what of those can change, do you think any of those are harmful and I will for those of you that are interested um, supply Edwin Zulu's chapter as well. So uh, you've got those slides, so we're not going to get into that. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for that. Um, but this is, of course, another um, good uh, awareness exercise in terms of thinking about the function and the influence of your culture. So almost finished rounding up the last two or three slides. Adrian Thatcher is one of the scholars whose work uh, in my personal development of uh, my theology has been quite influential because um, he has done uh, a lot of research in deconstructing uh, binary gender and especially the effects of binary gender when it comes to um, the variety of human sexuality and uh, the recognition of this being a construct and how it harms people of a, a variety of um, sexualities and genders who do not fit into our binary. He's done a lot of work on that. He's done a lot of work in feminist scholarship as well. And he says that participation in redemption, in other words, fixing a situation, making a situation better, requires intellectual, existential, and practical commitment. All three of those things. Intellectual commitment means attention must be given to the theology of gender in universities, theological societies, colleges, training courses, attention that far exceeds a lecture or two on domestic violence, which sometimes happens in my context. This is just this morning, I said to my colleague, I wish I can present this course that I'm presenting now. I can present to my undergrad situ students because I think they need this type of information and this awareness. But what happens is there's never space in our set curriculum for that. And it's a matter of a power imbalance to try and get it into the curriculum. So, um, yeah, I've experienced this personally, and I really think that this is something that requires our urgent attention. Existentially, in, in, a, in, in quotation marks, what uh, Thatcher calls lame efforts, at shoring, it's, in other words, squaring up, male power must continue to be counted. Um, and he says that what he means when he says this, he says in religious communities, because he speaks from a Christian religious perspective, 
there are too much idolatrous appeals. I've never heard it put this strongly, I must be honest. And I must also be honest that I totally agree. Um, if we are, he says, this action list for Christian communities includes critique of a male God, making appeals to a male God who is better imagined and among, um, by and among men, a male Jesus whose patriarchal embellishments disqualify him from being represented by a woman, an unchanging tradition which everyone knows has changed in innumerable ways, but we keep on perpetuating it, a very soft or mild reading of the Bible's texts of terror, which are lacking in any justice, context, or compassion. He says, existentially, we have to criticize these lame efforts at critiquing the overarching male power in these communities, because this male power is kept in force by placing this foundation or this justification of this male power in one of those five things, those four things mentioned. Practical, practical commitment. What is required in essence is an examination of congregational, liturgical, there comes the language, and family life. It basically requires Christians globally to engage. So if we are to get to a point of gender justice in the culture religion network, it requires intellectual, existential, and practical commitment. How can this look? And this is the final, the second last slide. A final positioning or awareness exercise for you to do one day in your communities would be, in her work about how Christian faith communities may respond to gender injustice, Elise Morkel in that chapter she uh, is a psychologist, she studied theology, but she wasn't able to become a minister and she became a psychologist and she's working in the Dutch Reformed Church mainly. Um, she recounts her personal journey about her community's response to gender injustice. And she names it the witness positions grid. And she says people find themselves somewhere on this grid. So position one would be aware and um, let's start at four. Four would be disempowered and unaware. Three would be disempowered and aware. Um, position two would be unaware and empowered. And position one, which is the one she says, if you are courageous and if you work hard and if you are uh, um, willing to become aware and willing to become aware of the different layers, you end up being in that witness position, empowered and aware. She says people in different communities find themselves somewhere on this grid when it comes to witnessing gender injustice. So they find themselves somewhere on a spectrum of being disempowered and unaware, or maybe being unaware, but being in a position to do something, but then they don't do something, or being aware of what's going on, but they're not in a position to do anything about it. They are disempowered. So she says people find themselves in different positions throughout uh, their uh, community's lifespan. And they are the different discussions or the different positions you would find yourself in. Unaware or disempowered, obvious, uh, buying, you are buying in into the um, traditions, religious practices. Um, you are bottom of the hierarchy due to your gender or your age or your race. So you're not empowered to do anything about it. You are unaware and empowered. You might be in a position to do something, but your awareness is not at the point where you are able to act on that, for example. And maybe you are at the bottom end of this hierarchy and you cannot um, uh, do anything about it. Aware and disempowered is that you are aware of what's going on, but then again, you're not in a position to do anything about it. And then aware and empowered is where you sometimes find yourself. I think if I read this quote, it might help you to understand a little bit better. All of us, whichever role, victim, perpetrator or witness we are currently in, can witness ourselves. We can become aware of what we see, witnessing ourselves as witnesses. We can become aware of what has happened to us, witnessing ourselves as victims. We can become aware of what we do to others, witnessing ourselves as perpetrators, more able to witness ourselves in each of these roles. We will be better able to witness others in each of these roles as well. That is my final comment. 
this whole um, quote tries to say something about what this whole lecture this morning was about, namely creating awareness. Thank you.